Yeah, we're not doctors or giving any medical advice. This show is intended for educational purposes only, and you should talk to your doctor about any medical issues. Now let's get at it. Welcome to Chat the Fat, where nutrition authors Nissa Gron and T.C. Hale are going to break down common low-carb mistakes. Let's chat all things low-carb, keto, digestion, and more so you can maximize your results. Hello, good people. Welcome back to Chat the Fat. This is episode 13, but it's not an unlucky episode. This is T.C. Hale. I'm here with the very lucky Nissa Gron. Say hello, lucky Nissa Gron. Hello. I'm not sure why I'm lucky, but I guess I am. It's not because you're hanging out with me, but it's because you're <laughs> anti-episode 13. I okay. like the buildings where like, they don't have a floor 13. I think that's kind of awesome. <laughs> that's a little yeah. creepy. <laughs> yeah. It's not just from a movie. It's, it's a real thing. It really happens. Check, yeah. check your elevator. So what's going on? Um, not too much, just ready to talk about different types of fats. Cause I know we're talking about high fat diets and people get really confused. Right. And they're just like, high fat. Okay. I'll just have all the fat. <laughs> if it has fat in the name, I'll, I'll listen to that podcast because it has fat in the name. And if it's in the food, I'll eat it. That's right. Okay. So break it down. Let's, let's jump right in there. So with so many keto success stories out there, there's a whole lot of people who are lowering their carbs and ramping up their fat in hopes of a keto success story of their very own. Wow. Now, while many of these keto, what many of these hopeful ketoers mean well, if they're ramping up with the wrong types of fat, they could actually be doing more harm than good for their best keto results. Since there's still so much misinformation given about healthy fats in the mainstream, in this episode, we are going to clear up some of the confusion that comes along with which types of fats you should consume. Yeah, so we we'll talk about some that are, that are generally good, some that are generally bad, and then we'll get into some specifics of like, yeah. maybe this is better for you and maybe this is better kind of thing. Yes, and we're going to be talking about this, but if anyone is still confused by the time we're done, we will have a guide that is going to help you determine which foods contain which fats. So once you determine the best fats for you, you know which foods to add and which foods to avoid, and you'll be able to find that at chatthefat.com slash episode 13. Yeah, and you can just download that for free, and that'll kind of help you out. And just in case we ramble, maybe you don't have to totally pay attention because you can just download that guide and that'll help you out. Yes, but you should still pay attention because you're here. So why not pay attention? Yeah, I was just, I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm not promising. <laughs> I'm not going to ramble. That's all I'm saying. Okay. All right. I'll try to rein you in. Okay. Good luck. All right. So um, before we start, there are different types of fats that you'll find in foods. And there are four different types that you can consume. And these include monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, saturated, and trans fats. Um, so before we tell you which one's the best for you, let's get to some definitions of these fats. So the first one is monounsaturated, and these are fats that are liquid at room temperature but start to harden when they're chilled. Uh, monounsaturated fats are found in plant foods, so some examples with higher amounts of monounsaturated fats include nuts, avocados, vegetable oils, and peanut oil or peanut butter. All right. And then the next one we get to polyunsaturated fats, and this is defined as fat molecules that have more than one unsaturated carbon bond in the molecule. That's why they're called poly, which is also called a double bond. So oils that contain polyunsaturated fats are typically also liquid at room temperature, but start to turn solid when they're chilled. And some examples of these include olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, flaxseed oil, walnuts, and sunflower seeds. And I know some of those will still say, stay liquid uh, when they're cold too, and it kind of can depend on the, on the oil itself. And I know that there was a big thing, uh, I think Dr. Oz talked about something at one point, like he's saying, uh, had somebody on the show that was talking about if you put your uh, olive oil in the fridge and it doesn't harden, then it's rancid and garbage olive oil. Um, and then there was a bunch of people who kind of disproved all that. I, I, don't, I never really dug into it because um, I don't use a ton of these things. And so we're going to talk about why I have some problems with polyunsaturated fats later, and it's going to freak some people out. 
and I made squinty eyes. If they're watching on YouTube, they can see my squinty eyes because Dr. Oz is one of the people back in the day who really confused me on the subject and gave me some pretty bad information. And you were drinking gallons of flaxseed oil at a time <laughs> because Dr. Oz was so dreamy? No. <laughs> All right. So um, these are the two types of fats that most of the mainstream consider the healthy fats. And a lot of health gurus push these as the fats that should make up the majority of your diet. And we'll definitely have more to say about that in a minute, but let's get to the other kinds of fats. So the next one that we'll define are saturated fats. And so these are fats that are mostly solid at room temperature, and they can include butter, unless you're in mm, Arizona, it gets melty. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, you can't yes. leave the butter out there. Oh, I do. Have... I do. It just gets melty. <laughs> so then when you want to put it on your food, you just have to wipe it up with a paper towel and then wipe the paper towel on your food? No, it's, it's going to be a, a, plate of, a plate of liquid butter there. <laughs> yeah, maybe on those 100 degree days. Yeah. Um, so it also includes ghee, palm oil, coconut oil, cheese, and red meat. And then finally, we get to the trans fats. And so these are also called trans fatty acids. And these are basically created in an industrialized process that adds hydrogen to liquid vegetable oils to make them more solid. So you may see these on food labeled as partially hydrogenated oils. And some examples of these trans fats include donuts, cookies, fried foods, and other commercially available foods that are made up with shortening or partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. And most people kind of know that trans fats are, are, are not ideal by now, but they also know that donuts are not always ideal <laughs> too. So maybe that's what helped them understand that. Yeah. Um, but pretty much every article that you pull up on Google is going to tell you to consume more mono and polyunsaturated fats, while they also state that you should avoid saturated and trans fats at all cost. So like you said, hopefully we all know to avoid foods like donuts and fried foods if we're trying to improve our health and lose weight. But if you just panicked because a lot of the foods consumed on a keto diet are filled with saturated fats like butter, coconut oil, and cheese, then we are here to clear up some myths about saturated fats. Yeah, and you really need to understand them because if you're going to do a high fat diet, but you're like afraid of saturated fats, guess what? Your, your diet isn't, isn't going to go so well. No. So why do you think saturated fats got a bad rap in the mainstream in the first place? Well, I, I know we'll have to maybe at least, at least touch on the answer keys thing, uh, for one thing. Um, but then there's other issues that have confused people and, Maybe let's, let's talk about the Ansel Keys thing first real quick in case there's, you know, a few people that have not heard that. I don't even remember the whole thing. It's been so long since I talked about it. Why don't you break it down for a second? Um, so basically, he published a study all the way back in the 70s stating that saturated fats were cl clogging arteries. But after further looking at the studies, it wasn't really the saturated fats that were causing the issue. It was the carbs that were found in these high fat foods that were causing the problems. And Ansel Keys neglected several other factors in the study that could have been the cause for heart disease. Um, but other factors is that the countries he used in the study also had the highest intake of sugars and refined carbs. And of course, we all know that there's politics and money involved in keeping this truth alive, even though a lot of the things that he found to be true were not true at all. Right, and, and we've talked before on other episodes that it's, it can be very problematic when you increase fat intake the way that we like to increase fat intake yet the person is still eating a lot of carbs and sugars you're you're by continuing to eat the carbs and sugars you're pushing your body into a glucose burning state to where it's going to want to store excess fats and if you're cranking up the fats that's that's a real problem but you know when someone goes to create any kind of study like this they have a hypothesis that they want to prove and you know the thing that some people don't talk about is that Basically, it was called the seven country study or something like that. I can't remember exactly. But when you looked at the studies on a chart, you could see that the amount of fat intake that they were consuming um, correlated with the heart disease issues. And it went right up the graph. And like, okay, I nailed it. Look at this. I proved that I'm awesome. What he didn't tell us was that the study was actually like a 37 country study. 
And if you put all of the countries in there, the graph wasn't a graph at all. It was just like numbers all over the board because all these other factors are involved with what's going on in the body. So he just took out and deleted all the studies that didn't back up his hypothesis. And that's not really science. That's just marketing. That is. Right. But there's other factors too that kind of followed that up. Like, um, you know, scientists, when they're looking at heart disease, some guy dies and then they cut him open and they're like, let's see what's inside. Look at all these guts. And then they're like, holy mackerel, there's so much saturated fat in here. Eating saturated fat made this guy dead. Uh, but the problem that, that we know now with that incorrect thought was that the saturated fats that are in those arteries and all those places that they're digging into are actually uh, palmitic acid, which is a saturated fat that's created by the body. It doesn't come from consuming it. It's created by the body, and the body creates this saturated fat when there are excess carbs. When there are more carbs than the person can burn for fuel, the body says, oh, I'm going to turn this into a saturated fat so I can save it for fuel later. And so much of these carbs are coming in that the body's making loads and loads of the saturated fat, and then it causes problems. So that's where some of the confusion has, has come from. Yeah, and even now, a lot of experts are telling us to avoid saturated fats because they're saying that it will lead to heart disease. They say that saturated fats lead to that cholesterol buildup in your arteries. And they also say that um, saturated fats raise your LDL, which is also called the bad cholesterol. So they're saying that this is also going to increase the risk for heart disease and also stroke. Um, and then experts are also trying to steer people away from saturated fats saying that they lead to weight gain because saturated fats are found in foods like pizza, baked goods, and fried foods, which we all know isn't just saturated fats. There's also carbs in there. And they also say that you should avoid saturated fats or even just fat in general because fat is higher in calories with nine calories per gram compared to only four grams, four calories per gram in carbohydrates or protein. Right. And so what we have to do as humans is, uh, as intelligent humans, or at least slightly intelligent, let's say awake, what we have to do as awake <laughs> humans is that we have to look at the fact that since they have been telling us to reduce our fat intake and to run away from saturated fats and to hide in terror from cholesterol, that nobody doing these things has created any improvement to the situation. Um, Yet, we see people all the time who knock the carbs out of their diet and all of a sudden their cholesterol comes down naturally and their high blood pressure comes down naturally and all these heart disease markers come down naturally. So we have to say, okay, since this makes sense and we're seeing results, maybe we go that route. Because in the medical world, the things that they're saying make sense, so to speak, with my air quotes, because like I said, you know, you cut somebody open, all those saturated fats in there, it makes sense to tell the person to avoid saturated fats if you don't understand where those saturated fats are coming from. But now we know where they're coming from. The problem is that when they make these discoveries, they don't just go on the news and everybody says in unison, hey, shut it down. We were wrong. It takes 20 or 30 years to figure this stuff out. Yeah, and um, when I was 12 or 13, I went for a cheerleading physical, and they actually told me that my cholesterol was high, so this was like back 1992, 93, they told me my cholesterol was high, and they warned me to stay away from high fat foods, and they were telling me to eat all the carbs, and then we all know that I had another 20 years of poor health, and um, I was trying to do my best, but my cholesterol didn't go down until I started taking the carbs out of my plan and adding in more saturated fats. But did you at least get to say, ready, okay, go Rangers? I did, but only okay. for a year. Right. <laughs> and we're good. actually the Rams, the Worth oh, Rams. <laughs> good. And I figured it was something, yeah. You're close. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, it... It's not news that we've been misguided for a long time. We, we've all been making a lot of mistakes for a lot of decades. But the thing is that it just takes new information a very long time to catch up to the mainstream. And, and that's just how it is. But you, as an awake human, 
you get to make your own choices. So that's, that's good news. And so that's why we're here today, because there are reasons that saturated fat is not the enemy. So we'll go through some of those reasons in case you're still concerned about eating your butter and your coconut oil. So like we already talked about, it was the sugar and the refined carbs causing the health problems in the studies that were used to make a case against saturated fats. But there are several benefits of saturated fats, and some of these include improved weight loss, of course, when carbs are lowered. Um, they also include stronger bones, since saturated fat is required for calcium to be effectively incorporated into the bone. And then there's improved liver health, which saturated fat has been shown to protect the liver from alcohol and medications, including anti I can't say that Sedimentophine. word. Sedimentophine. Yeah. That one, and Tylenol, the one found in Tylenol, yeah. <laughs> and other drugs commonly used for pain and arthritis. Um, saturated fats is also great for a healthy brain. Since your brain is mainly made up of fat and cholesterol, a diet that's low in saturated fats will rob your brain of the raw materials that it needs in order to function optimally. And then another big benefit, of course, is for your immune system. Having insufficient saturated fatty acids in white blood cells hampers their ability to recognize and destroy foreign invaders such as viruses, bacteria, and fungi. And also, um, they're delicious. They are. We totally left that, that benefit out. Yes, all the butter. Even the melty butter. Right, yeah. <laughs> okay, so next let's talk about polyunsaturated fats. While there are many mainstream health gurus like Dr. Oz who tell you to load up on these fats, there are other experts who suggest that vegetable oils actually may increase the risk for heart disease and mortality instead of lowering it like a lot of mainstream sources will tell you. And part of the reason for this is PUFAs, which is their um, the short word for them, PUFAs. They're damaged by excess heat which is used when processing these oils. And it's also important to note that these oils are refined, bleached, deodorized, and boiled. So a lot of them have their nutrients and anti antioxidants just stripped right out, which can render these oils toxic and difficult to digest, which I know you know a thing or two about. Yeah, the digest <laughs> part. Yeah. yeah, and also, you know, they, 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 know, they, they know that a lot of these oils are bad when you know they're heated and stuff but also we're as humans we're a little we're hotter than we think you know <laughs> and, and we have the ability to heat these oils when we consume them as well in a manner and that some people believe that that has some effect on some of the damage they can cause and then um the PUFAs they're also high in omega-6 fats and so you want your omega-6 and omega-3 ratio to be eaten in the right ratio, but a lot of people get way too many omega-6 fats, but not enough omega-3 fats. So how can the omega-6 fats actually cause damage? Well, it, they seem to be a little bit more in, inflammatory, especially when they're not in the right ratios. But, you know, I, I'm definitely going to ruffle some feathers here talking about this because it's it's really all of the all the fatty acids like the omega threes, all the things that everybody is saying is essential and that you gotta have these and and then drink a gallon of them and it's it's not just the uh you know uh, mainstream is still doing a lot of cooking with canola oil and all these horrible vegetable oils, but even the people who are awake and they're actually trying to take the right steps to improve their health um a lot of them are still using a lot of these, uh, you know, flaxseed oils and fish oils and all these things that everyone is, is telling us to use and, and have been for a long time. And I, I use a lot of them for a long time. But the problem is, is that there's a lot of evidence now, and I've seen it a lot, a lot, a lot firsthand, is that these omega-3s seem to have an anti-inflammatory uh, ability, which is why people promote them so strongly, but it appears that the way that they do it can actually create an increase in inflammation long term, uh, especially when it comes to insulin resistance. And 
when you look at insulin resistance, everybody knows, okay, the person doesn't process carbs very well because they're insulin resistant. Uh, the insulin is not doing its job correctly, so the carbs don't get processed. Well, whenever there's an imbalance like that, and whenever there's a, something that's broken, there's the ability to be broken in the other direction. And the other direction is hypoglycemic people, the people who process carbs and sugars too well. And then their blood sugar drops too far, and then they go kind of psycho. You've seen those people. Yep. Right. So what we do is we've seen that you can actually take omega-3s and fatty acids like fish oil and thing, and you can give them to these people that are uh, hypoglycemic and their insulin is too powerful, too effective. And you can give it to them, and it will make them more insulin resistant. And it will allow them to keep their blood sugar on a more even keel so they don't crash so hard. So we see this over and over again. It's like amazing how well it works. But when you understand that, you need to understand that it's because these fatty acids are pushing people towards insulin resistance. And even in the keto world, there's a lot of people who are like, I get half of my fat from saturated fats and the other half from omega-3s and fish oils and flaxseed oil and all these things. And they don't understand that by taking that so consistently and for so long that they're actually pushing themselves more insulin resistant. And uh, that in itself creates a lot of inflammation. Um, but beyond that, just the omega-3s themselves um, have the ability to uh, be problematic because of how they're processing the body. So... The thing is, is that they're in just about everything, you know, omega, omega-3s are in, in just like all kinds of foods. So your body can handle it, but it's when you're chugging it down and I'm going to take some extra flaxseed oil today and I'm just going to take a dose of this and a dose of that. That's when it can really become problematic and start uh, pushing a person towards insulin resistance. So I don't run in fear from all the foods that have them and some of them have less, like olive oil is the one I like the best because that has some omega-3s in there but it's not such a high amount um, and I don't use it all the time I certainly don't use it every day uh, because it's more problematic for me than it would be for someone uh, with different imbalances like I tend to be too catabolic and all those omega-3s are very pro catabolic so a person who's in that kind of situation uh, can really make some problems much worse by using these so-called healthy oils um, and rambled. Boom. Although, um, so I like to keep up with my doctors. I've been going to quite a few doctors trying to get through some lingering health problems. And just like you, I lean more catabolic from all my years of dieting and over-exercising. And every doctor I see, and these are the natural doctors, so naturopaths and um, other doctors like that, still are pushing the fish oil on me. Every doctor wants me to take large amounts of fish oil and I try to explain to them that it's not right for my chemistry and some of them are okay with it and some of them are like, well, just wait a week and then try it again. And they just want, to, <laughs> they just want me to keep trying and push it down even though I tell them I take one fish oil pill and I almost get an immediate headache that lasts for the next three days. Right. And if you read anything from Ray Pete, uh, he gets real upset about uh, all the, the fatty acids and everything that people are promoting. And he talks a lot about the actual damage that they can do and uh, especially all the science that shows um, that the science that they're using as a basis to promote this, um, a few years later, other scientists showed that that was wrong. Um, that it was a mistake and that uh, the reasons why it looked like they were being beneficial. But it's almost like, um, what are they called? The steroids that are kind of anti-inflammatory steroids that so many people use now to kind of reduce inflammation. Well, we know now that a lot of those things are reducing inflammation by turning off the immune system. Um, so that inflammatory response is part of the immune system kind of dealing with a problem. That's what that inflammation is about. So um, we know that those are turning off the immune system, but the fatty acids and the omega-3s have the ability to have a similar effect when used in uh, the larger doses like most people are being told to do. So 
my stance is that I don't f- so freak out about it. There's a lot of people that are like, don't ever use any kind of omega-3 at all. Don't touch it, run from it. I don't have quite a stance like that because there are people who have extreme issues from being like hypoglycemic or too anabolic. And I find that these are very beneficial for those people and can help them kind of balance things out. And I myself, even though they're not right for me, I try not to stress about avoiding everything because they're just in a lot of foods. And so I just don't add extra. And uh, I seem to do fine with that point of view. And so there's um, a lot of recipes that call for vegetable oils, especially olive oil when cooking. Now, why is this a bad recommendation? Now, this is one that I do say, hey, don't do that. You know, <laughs> yeah. I say don't. don't. I've keep. heard you say that. <laughs> yeah, I have mentioned that. Um, because when these oils are heated, they, it changes the molecular structure and they become more of a toxic uh, substance that you're putting in your body. So uh, you can put olive oil on food after you cook it. It can even still be you know, warm food. You just don't want it to be like in the pan reaching those types of temperatures. Okay. And so if we're not using olive oil, since that's pretty much in every recipe, what oil should we be cooking with? What do you cook with? I cook with a lot of coconut oil and butter. That's what I use too. And sometimes I'll use like a beef tallow or maybe like a duck fat, you know, something rendered duck fat or something like that just to be like, "Ah, I'm going to use something different to mix it up. You know, we're actually, um, we're from Chicago and one of my husband's favorite restaurants that doesn't exist anymore is called Hot Dogs, a take on hot dogs. And um, every Friday and Saturday he had duck fat fries. Sweet. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. (laughs) <laughs> right. It's a big draw. Um, yeah, so those are the fats that I that I like to cook with. And I I usually don't use anything else. Some people use some other things, but I find that, that those do best for me. I know a lot of people will cook in their leftover bacon grease, which I have tried it. It's a little too strong for me. I think I tried cooking cow in it once, and then I just ended up burping up bacon grease all day. So I don't really do that. <laughs> I have definitely done that. And I do, I do like that because it adds an extra layer of flavor to some things. Now, if you did it with eggs, that might be a little freaky, but um, mm-hmm. like if I'm cooking like a steak or something like that, it, it can make it kind of yummy. Yeah. I'd actually be interested to see what eggs would taste like with that. <laughs> yeah. I think that might be weird. <laughs> um, so are there differences between mono and polyunsaturated fats as far as which are better to consume or is that more of like a per person thing? Um, I think a lot of the monounsaturated fats, uh, foods like avocados and stuff have lower levels of the unsaturated fats. And it, it seems to be that um, a lot of the unsaturated fats can be problematic for people just because our our body temperature is not set up to thrive on that, like a a cold water fish or something like that. It has a lower body temperature. Um, So, uh, you know, a lot of the foods that are, that are really high in those um, types of fats also can be high on the list of foods that cause food sensitivities for the largest amount of people. Um, You know, like especially avocados and nuts. uh, Those are things that I can eat. Um, occasionally, but if I eat them, you know, every week, they, I don't feel so great. Like I, I, when my digestion was not good and I was on PPIs and all that kind of stuff, I created some food sensitivities. And those are some of the things that I, that I can, that are problematic for me. Um, so I don't do a lot of the avocados and I don't tell people to eat buckets of avocados, but I'm always fine with people eating them just because it's a good source of fat. It is a, it's a real food. Yeah. Also a good source of potassium if you're looking for more potassium in your keto diet. Right. So why are the MUFAs and the PUFAs pushed as the healthy fats so much in the mainstream? Well, because it's not fried. It's not French fries. Okay. Yeah. And so they, uh, they kind of realized that, look, this, we were running from fats and we were wrong. So let's start promoting some, but we're not going to do saturated fat yet. Let's promote these other ones because they're not saturated. It's just, it's the main view is that this is that saturated is bad. So unsaturated um, must be good, but we know that the saturated is not bad and that the unsaturated can be problematic when 
at high levels. So if somebody is eating all these nuts and taking all this flaxseed oil and um, they have you know, a slice of steak with their bowl of seven avocados in there, then those things can be problematic and you'll want to cut those down. Um, but I'm just not on the run from them completely boat like some people are. Okay. And I mean, also we need to look at the money. Where is the money going? Because a lot of these crops are subsidized for more profits of the vegetable oils, whereas it's not as profit worthy for to push coconut oil or butter. Right. And a lot, a lot of these oils, they just started using them because they learned that it could help fatten up a cow give, by giving it less food. <laughs> so they were like, oh, let's, we'll use these things to fatten up the cow. So let's grow more of these crops. Like, wow, these crops are cheap. Now we got a bunch of these. Why don't we just sell them to people? <laughs> to fatten comes, up the people? <laughs> here comes buckets of money. And that's kind of what it turned out doing. It, it fattened up the people. But now, so far, we don't send the people to the, the butcher shop. So that's, that's good. Let's try to avoid moving in that direction as well. And then I think another reason that the mainstream is pushing them is some of these um, MUFAs and PUFAs are said to lower the bad cholesterol. But we've already kind of talked about in previous episodes that it's not always the amount of cholesterol that matters. It's actually the size. Right. But to see even... I, I used to want to write a cholesterol book that was like, just like do the opposite of what they tell you. <laughs> it's everything they say, say, okay, and then do the opposite of that. Because the things that, you know, even though we know now about the, you know, the particle sizes and the, of the cholesterol and all that kind of stuff it, it is important. Um, even beyond that, the things that they suggest to lower cholesterol are just horribly wrong. And it's just, it's a mess. And so, um, like we already kind of talked about, a lot of health gurus and doctors are recommending a daily dose of fish oil for the people that think that they need to take it. Is just testing their chemistry something you would recommend, or how should they go about whether or not they should take that? Yeah, uh, uh, you could definitely look at your chemistry. We have a, a, an almost free course. It's 50 cents, so it keeps out all the spam registrations at, at kickitnaturally.com uh, forward slash uh, keto digest. Um, and that kind of shows you how to run simple tests. So you can kind of look at your chemistry and see, am I already leaning too catabolic? Because if you are taking all of those fatty acids is making many things horribly, horribly worse. And if you're not, um, I, I still would do less, you know, there's foods that you can eat that have those in them, you know, like some fish and some things like that. Uh, I, I like to see people do that just because the level of increase in the dose coming in like that is not as beneficial as people think. Uh, as it goes in, it can be anti-inflammatory, but like we talked about, long-term, it's going to likely create more inflammation and be immunosuppressive and problems like that. Insulin resistant, driving, all that. One of those doctors that I told you about that was trying to get me to take fish oil and he said, just wait a week and try it again. He was also trying to get me to eat fish, which I just can't get behind. I never liked fish. And I know that it's not right for me because when he tried to force it on me, I actually cried. <laughs> Sweet. I like it when the doctors make you cry. Yeah. So I definitely know that fish is not the right thing for me, but I learned that about myself by taking the digestion course. Right, right. Um, so speaking of being in a catabolic or anabolic imbalance, um, how can people determine which are the right fats for them? Like people who are catabolic should be eating different fats than someone who might be leaning anabolic. Yeah. So if, if someone is a uh, push to anabolic where their body's kind of stuck in that rebuild and repair mode, you know, most of the time, I, I like to use olive oil as a, as a great fat because that is slightly pro catabolic and can help balance out that person. But if someone's too catabolic, like you and I tend to be um, more of the saturated fats like uh, butter and, and coconut oil uh, can help improve that imbalance. So you know, we, we talk all the time and everybody talks about how beneficial coconut oil can be and how it can help somebody lose weight. But if somebody's severely anabolic and they're having a whole bunch of coconut oil, they can really make that imbalance worse and have a hard time losing weight. So that's why we really like to talk about 
nothing is right for everybody. We need to look at the person and figure out what's going to be beneficial for them. And in both of these cases, that doesn't mean that if someone's anabolic, they can never use coconut oil. I just like to see them take steps to improve that in balance before they start eating a lot of coconut oil. Same with olive oil. It's not right for my chemistry, but I still, you know, consume it because I'm taking other steps to balance things out. Yes. And since coconut oil is so beneficial and I do lean catabolic, I have a ton of recipes filled with coconut oil for fat bombs on my website. So if you don't know how to eat more coconut oil, definitely check out eating fat as in skinny.com to get some of those yummy recipes. Right. Um, okay. So we have a listener question and this is Jane from Phoenix, Arizona. And she said, how do you get your spouse on board with your new keto lifestyle? Cooking for my family would be so much easier if you would eat keto as well. So do you have any suggestions on getting your spouse to eat keto? Um, no, <laughs> I do not. Holy mackerel, that's a tricky area. You can't, you can't tell your spouse how to do something. Like, it just uh, it doesn't go well at all. And, you know, like, um, Sarah, we met because I hired her as my assistant. And so I was like the boss. And I was also her trainer and health coach. Like all that, I was just like nonstop telling her what to do, like forever. Um, <laughs> so when we started dating, she's like, yeah, I'm shutting that down. <laughs> so so uh, she does, she no longer works for me. And uh, man, when it comes to this stuff, I can't, she has to ask questions. I can't tell her how to do anything. That's just, and I, I hear that from other clients too, because I train a lot of uh, couples and which is fun because you can kind of run their life. Oh, she says this, you know, uh, but I, I find the best way to do this is to lead by example. And because like when you lost a bucket load of weight, all of a sudden Jason's more interested in what do you do? What, you, what are you doing over there? Uh, if, if you have a husband that's at least a little bit afraid of you, then you just <laughs> sometimes have to give him a look. Give him a dirty look when he's eating something that's not ideal and he'll catch on soon enough. Right. <laughs> Which he did. So that was your that was your plan? Yeah, just to make sure your husband is a little bit of scared afraid of you for mm -hmm. whatever reason, just because you're a woman and he's a man and men don't always understand women. <laughs> cool. So teaching through fear. I like it. This is great. It works. <laughs> yeah. All right. So there's one point of view and the other one is is lead by example. So you can just use your own mixture of which one of those works best for you. Or you could just show them how delicious the food you're eating is. And a lot of times they'll come around, especially once, like you said, once they see the results you're getting and you're eating such delicious food, they will come over to the keto side. Right. Because it's tricky when, if they understood, if they could hear the information and understand why it's beneficial, then surely they would want to, you know, make an adjustment. But once they've kind of shut the door, it's hard to get information in because as soon as you start talking about it, it's all, you know, kind of shut down. Yeah. All right. So we have a product review and this week we're actually going to be reviewing two products because um, we're talking about fats. So we want to talk about more ways to get more fat in your diet. Um, the first one that I have is Thrive Market Organic MCT Oil. Um, have you ever tried this brand of MCT oil? I have not. Okay. Well, what about just MCT oil in general? Why is it good or not good for a keto diet? Um, I, I, basically, I basically see benefits to it, especially when someone is transitioning. Um, but I don't use it. And I don't use it with clients that much, um, especially once they've really gotten keto adapted and things are going well because I don't know. I just like, there's a lot of, you can get MCTs in coconut oil and other things that you're eating. I like to see people use food, but when someone's first starting out, it can really help to speed up pushing someone into ketosis in a big way. It can really speed things up like that. The problem is that if the person uses even a little bit too much for what they can handle, they will sit on the toilet. That is true. Yeah. And they'll, and they'll sit on it for like weeks and not understand what's going wrong. And I must be, I don't know what it is, but then I will right, we'll just cut down the MCT oil for 30 minutes and you're going to see that it's going to be a big difference. And that's usually how it is. So I, 
there are benefits that I see. I just don't like it to see anybody get too, too excited about it because then I'm going to use too much and ah. Yeah. Okay. I, um, so break actually, down how you use it and what, what, how you got in. So when you're think, speaking about um, sitting on the toilet, I actually had a doctor recommend this for when my son was a baby for constipation to add just a little bit of MCT oil to his bottle to help that out. So Oh, wow. <laughs> we had a very natural doctor. Yeah, did uh, that help? It did, yeah. It oh, did, but, tried that. but she just said that you just want to do just a little because like you said, too much is too much. Mm-hmm. Um, but as you can see, I have this little pour on my MCT oil because one of the drawbacks of MCT is it's really messy when you're pouring it. So I ordered these pours that are used for alcohol bottles and I keep that on there and it serves out like a nice serving. Um, but basically most of the time I use MCT oil for my kids because they're not keto and um, they like to eat all the carbs, so I spike their low sugar juice with MCT oil and collagen, so they get some nutrients in their diet. <laughs> right. right. Um, so this helps get them healthy fats. Um, so that's one way I use it. And then also when I am drinking um, an iced coffee, I like to add fat to it and butter. If you add butter or coconut oil, it gets oh, solid. <laughs> right. You can't do that with an iced coffee. Yeah, it doesn't come through the straw very well. So MCT oil is great for that, and that's really the only time that I use MCT oil over coconut oil. Right. So it, it seems like we both have, it's, it's good stuff, but I, I'm not going to have somebody uh, taking a dose three times a day um, just to try to magnify their ketosis. I'm, I'm fine with people using it as they're getting in, but once they get in, I, I'd rather them do more real food and maybe just use that on occasion. And then um, the other product I had is kind of similar. It's the Bulletproof Brain Octane Oil, which is called Rocket Fuel for Brain and Body. Um, have you ever tried this one? Mm-mm. So this one, um, I'm curious to see what you think about the ingredients. I actually got it because, like I said, I had some lingering health issues dealing with toxic mold. And um, the Bulletproof guy, Dave Asprey, also had the same issue. So I was following some of his advice, and he uses products that are supposed to be good for people sensitive to mold. Um, So I got this and the ingredients are caprylic acid triglycerides from highly refined coconut oil. So is this pretty much the same thing? Yeah, I've heard a lot of, uh, you know, caprylic acid can be very effective with dealing with things like that. So I haven't used that, but I like those ingredients. That seems like that would be beneficial. Um, How long have you been using it? Um, well, it's almost empty, so <laughs> maybe about a month or so. <laughs> you, have you felt any changes, or do you feel like you liked it? Or, um, To be honest, like physically when I drink the MCT oil or the brain octane oil, I don't really notice a difference. Um, they kind of kind of feel the same way. Um, so I don't know overall if it's helping with my treatment or not, but um, yeah, it, it felt the yeah, same I way. I feel like MCT caprylic oil. acid is something with a lot of caprylic acid like that would be would be beneficial for that. And I would, I would be fine with somebody doing that and maybe even uh, recommend that. Yeah. And that's what he recommended. So I'm following some of his recommendations since he's had the same issues, but um, yeah, my bottle's almost empty. So time to order a new one. (laughs) Okay, cool. All right. And so like we mentioned at the beginning of the show, we have a guide of foods that are high in each of the fats, so saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, and trans fats. So once you figure out which fats are right for you, you will know which foods to implement more and which foods to avoid more. Cool. So you can get that at chatthefat.com forward slash episode 13. Yes. And then um, next week for episode 14, you're not invited again because it is just me. And I am going to, <laughs> I'm going to get in total carbs versus net carbs, which is sometimes a controversial topic in the keto community. Okay, awesome. So love to hear from you guys on other topics you want to uh, hear us talk about. So you just go to chatthefat.com and, and click on the contact us and let us know about questions you might want us to cover on a show or, or topics you want to dig into. And we'll see you guys soon. Whether you're brand new to keto or just looking to move past roadblocks, Join us for our next Troubleshooting Keto Master Workshop. Go to chatthefat.com slash workshop to find upcoming dates and register for this totally free event. You just might find your missing piece of the puzzle. Until then, we'll see you next week on Chat the Fat.